Hello, Providence family. My name is Hosanna, and this week we get to finish our study of the Old Testament prophets with uh, Malachi and Zechariah. Then we'll dive into the last historical biblical account or chronicle of Israel's history, and then we will end with um, beginning our study of the longest chapter in the Bible, Psalm 119. So in Zechariah, uh, the first thing that stuck out to me was that the title used for God is the Lord of Hosts. I started underlining it, and literally my Bible is now covered in the book of Zechariah with black ink because it's just so common. I didn't really know what to do with the title of the Lord of Hosts, so I looked it up and found out that it actually uh, refers to the Lord being the commander of heavenly hosts. So it's a military term, which is really appropriate because kind of um, the theme in Zechariah is that the Lord of Hosts, or God, is this rightful king of Israel, but that they're not listening to this call to return to the Lord of Hosts. In the first six chapters, uh, Zechariah goes into these eight separate but related visions, which involve things like four horsemen, a flying scroll, uh, the priest Joshua, the righteous ruler Zerubbabel, and a lot of other things which I, I found kind of confusing. But in the midst of it all, there's this consistent theme that the Lord is going to judge the wicked, um, but also be faithful to involve the righteous few in the redemptive story that he's writing. This section of visions ends in chapter 6 with a reference to this coming servant branch who will rebuild the temple and establish his throne as the priestly king. To me, that sounded a lot like Jesus, but if you disagree with me on this or anything else, please leave a comment below. I'd love to discuss it with you further. Chapter 7 offers a brief window into the current issues of Zechariah's time where uh, the Lord of Hosts essentially says, I don't care about all the fasting in the morning you have been doing because it wasn't for me that you did it. Uh, and if it was, you would care about those things that matter to me, like justice, kindness, and mercy. Uh, but you actually have diamond hard hearts, and you can't even hear my voice. Now for us, Providence uh, Church, we just walked through a month of fasting and prayer for a building. Would we not take this passage as a discouragement against fasting, but as a reminder um, that when we fast, it is to listen with soft hearts to the voice of the Lord. And that regardless of what answer we hear from the Lord during that time of fasting, would we be a people who in justice, kindness, and mercy reflect our Lord of hosts. In chapters 8 through 14, again, we find uh, more futuristic prophecy. prophecy. There's a uh, judgment on Jerusalem with a hopeful promise for a remnant, judgment on neighboring nations with the hopeful promise the Lord is coming as a good shepherd to his people in place of the bad shepherd that they've had for a very long time. But then in chapter 13, we hear that this shepherd, the Lord, uh, is struck down. And in the final chapter, the day of the Lord comes and the nations rise up against Jerusalem. But instead of Jerusalem's destruction, actually what happens is the Lord of hosts comes with his heavenly host, uh, shows up, goes all Dwayne the Rock Johnson on them, and restores Jerusalem to a peaceful and whole Garden of Eden state where the nations can come in submission to the Lord of hosts. As you read this entire book, I want to challenge you for two things. One, notice uh, the links to which the Lord of hosts is going to go to restore um, his people to wholeness. And then I want you to reflect on this question. How long are the Lord's people going to wait before they join him in this process of becoming whole? Malachi. While Zechariah was mostly dramatic visions with prophecy of future judgment and a variety and a very minimal amount of present day commentary, Malachi on the other is extreme is a commentary about the present day Israel of the prophet's day. And it wasn't a happy commentary because despite the fact that um, these were the Jews whose ancestors God's wrath had judged for breaking their covenants, this remnant of Israel is still doing the same thing and continuing to break their covenant to the Lord of hosts. As you read this book, watch out for this dialogue that happens between the kingly Lord of heaven's armies and his people. In a lot of ways, uh, this reading is like a conversation uh, slash dispute between a gracious ruler and his very unruly subjects. Israel is not obeying the covenant with the Lord, and uh, as written in Leviticus. And this disobedience uh, can be seen in their half-hearted sacrifice offerings and divorce, which is so common in their society. A nerving truth? Both of these critiques could be brought about against the American church today, so pretty convicting. Um, with the themes of broken covenants and unapproved worship, as Israel refuses to listen to Lord's instructions, chapter 3 gives us hope as it speaks of the coming messenger Elijah, who will prepare the way for the Lord. Uh, and eventually in chapter 4, Israel gets this promise of a future prophet who, in the day of the Lord, will bring about repentance and judgment. Then after 400 years after this book is written, um, Jesus would come, but instead of judging others, he bore their judgment. 
Providence Church, we know that this prophet Jesus will one day come back again as the world's judge. When he does, would he find us being a people who in love for him, worship him rightly, and value covenants like marriage just the way he does? As we dive into Chronicles, our last historical book of the Old Testament, this story starts off with nine meticulous chapters of genealogies. Up right, upfront disclaimer, I do not particularly enjoy reading genealogies. Um, for our culture, where most of us don't even remember the name of our great-grandparents, it's hard for us to appreciate the significance of them. But to the historian of Chronicles, uh, telling the genealogies was a foundational piece for Israel's story. For Israel to know what direction they were moving towards, they had to recognize who they had come from. As you read these chapters, rather than skimming through this list of names, I would challenge you to search out the stories of faith and broken faith, which are alluded to continually throughout these chapters, and then compare these stories with the prayer of Jabez in chapter 4. Read the chapters prayerfully, reflecting on the stories of faith and broken faith written in your own family history and where these stories are moving you towards. Lastly, this week we'll be reading through uh, the first 40 verses of Psalm 119. As you read the psalm throughout the week, highlight all the different ways the psalmist describes the word of the Lord and the action verses that the psalmist associates with his response to the word of the Lord. Pray for yourself for a similar hunger, commitment, and devotion to the, the word of the Lord. And may we as a church body have a similar delight uh, and affection for God's word. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email them to info at providenceomaha.org. Shalom, Providence family.